talking about vasopressors and inotropes. I am Dr. Shipra Agarwal, Professor from Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care, Vardhaman Mahavir Medical College and Sadhajang Hospital. So the specific learning objectives for this lecture are given below. So before we start our lecture, we should understand about the basic terms vasopressors and inotropes. So vasopressors are the drugs that basically increase the systemic vascular resistance and hence will lead to an increase in the mean arterial pressure. Inotropes, on the other hand, are the drugs which increase the cardiac output by increasing the myocardial contractility. Now, as you can see, that mean arterial pressure is a product of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. So, inotropes increase the cardiac output by increasing the myocardial contractility and vasopressors increase the systemic vascular resistance. So, both of these agents ultimately lead to an increase in mean arterial pressure and hence are used in the treatment of various types of shocks. Now, there are certain other terms which are important. First one is inotropy, which means increase in the contractility of the heart. The next is chronotropy, which means increase in the heart rate. And the drugs here mainly act on the sinoatrial node. Then the next is the lusitropy, which means the diastolic relaxation. Dromotropy, which is increase in the conduction velocity by acting on the atrioventricular node. And bathmotropy, which increase mainly the pacemaker excitability. As you can see, cardiac output is a product of heart rate and stroke volume. So when there is increase in heart rate, it could be either by chromotropy or dromotropy. Now, in the stroke volume, if there is left ventricular and diastolic volume relaxation, this is leucotropy. Inotropy is increase in the stroke volume and afterload is increased by increase in the systemic vascular resistance. Now, Another important concept is the adrenoreceptors. Adrenoreceptors are the various receptors which are present in the sympathetic nervous system on which vasopressors and inotropes act. So these are typically of three types, the alpha receptors, the beta receptors and the dopaminergic receptors. As you can see, the alpha receptors are further the alpha 1 receptors which are mainly present in the postsynaptic area, the alpha 2 receptors which are present in the postsynaptic as well as the presynaptic area, the beta 1 receptors again present in the postsynaptic area, beta 2 receptors in the pre and the postsynaptic area and the dopaminergic receptors which are again type 1 and type 2. So, the adrenergic receptors divided into alpha and beta. Alpha is further subdivided into the alpha 1 types and the alpha 2 subtypes. Beta is divided into beta 1 to beta 3 subtypes. So, coming on to the alpha receptors. The alpha receptors as we have discussed earlier is of two types. Alpha 1 receptors and alpha 2 receptors. Alpha 1 receptors are present in the postsynaptic area and are predominantly located on the vascular smooth muscle. So, their main function is to cause vasoconstriction. The alpha 2 receptors are present both in the pre and the postsynaptic area. But these receptors are generally not involved in the regular of the blood pressure and heart rate. The beta receptors of which the beta 1 receptor is mainly present in the heart, it will result in both inotropy and the chronotropic effects. The beta 1 receptors are also present in the renal system which will result in increased renin production. The beta 2 receptors mainly lead to smooth muscle relaxation and are present in blood vessels which will result in vasodilatation. It is also present in the pulmonary system and will lead to bronchodilatation also. The beta 3 receptors are present in the fat cells. The dopaminergic receptors are DA1 and DA2 re 
receptors of which the receptor of clinical importance is the da1 receptors which are present in the renal splanchnic mesentery and the coronary blood vessels the effect of these receptors is mediation of the vasodilatation which is maximally seen in the renal blood vas vasculature system now what is the mechanism of the action of the alpha receptors whenever an alpha agonist act on the alpha receptor then through phospholipase c it will result in the activation of the calmodulin dependent protein kinase which will result in vasoconstriction on the other hand whenever a beta agonist acts on the beta receptor there is increased in cyclic amp production now if this increase in cyclic amp is in the myocardium it will result in calcium channel activation which will result in positive chronotropy and also will result in actin myosin troponin interaction which will result in positive inotropy also but if this increase in cyclic amp is present in the vascular smooth muscles then there will be augmented calcium uptake by the sarcoplasmic reticulum which will result in vasodilatation now what are the various precursors for these vasopressors and inotropes so now what do you understand by the term catecholamines catecholamines is any compound which has a benzene ring and two hydroxyl subgroups now phenylalanine tyrosine and l dopa are the precursor essential amino acids from which these catecholamine vasopressors and inotropes are derived now dopamine is the precursor for norepinephrine and epinephrine dopamine norepinephrine and epinephrine together forms the natural catecholamines on the other hand dobutamine and isoprotenol are the synthetic catecholamines note that phenylephrine is not a catecholamine because although it has a benzene ring but it does not has a second hydroxyl subgroup so it's a synthetic non catecholamine so the classification for vasotropes and inotropes is as follows they could be catecholamines which could be further subdivided as natural and synthetic they could be non catecholamines in the sympathomimetics vasopressin phosphodiesterase inhibitors which is the pd3 inhibitors cardiac glycosides and calcium sensitizers so vasotropes and inotropes they could be adrenergic if they act on the adreno receptors and they could be non adrenergic if they don't act on the adrenergic receptors the adrenergic vasopressors and inotropes could be catecholamines or non catecholamines catecholamines are further subdivided into natural and synthetic natural catecholamines will be adrenaline non adrenaline and dopamine synthetic catecholamines will be isoprenaline and dobutamine of the non catecholamine groups there could be direct acting which could be phenylephrine or indirect acting which acts by the release of norepinephrine at the synaptic cleft so of these will be ephedrine and the commonly used mephedrine the non adrenergic ones are the phosphodiesterase inhibitors which will be acting by the inhibition of the phosphodiesterase 3 enzymes of which an important example is mildrenone and other miscellaneous drugs include digoxin and calcium now coming on to the individual agents dopamine so dopamine is an endogenous central neurotransmitter it is an immediate precursor of norepinephrine and epinephrine the clinical dose in which the dopamine is used is around 2 to 20 micrograms per kg per minute actions of dopamine could be direct and indirect it directly acts on the alpha 1 beta 1 and the dopaminergic 1 receptors and has an agonist action it also exerts an indirect effect by the release of norepinephrine now the activation of the various receptors depends on the dose in which dopamine is used at low doses which is less than 5 mics per kg per minute it mainly activates the dopaminergic receptors and will result in renal and splanchnic vasodilatation at moderate doses of 3 to 10 mics per kg per minute it activates the beta adrenergic receptors and will result in increased inotropy and chronotropy 
At higher doses of 10 to 20 mics per kg per minute, it will result in activation of alpha adrenergic receptors and peripheral vasoconstriction. So it is available as 200 mg per 5 ml ampule in a concentration of 40 mg per ml in dopamine hydrochloride injection. As discussed earlier, dose of 1 to 3 mics per kg per minute, meaning the dopaminergic receptors will get activated at moderate doses, beta receptors will get activated and at high doses of more than 10, alpha adrenergic stimulated peripheral vasoconstriction will be seen. So you must have all heard about the renal dosage and the benefit of the low dose dopamine in increasing the renal blood flow. But now the recent studies show that it is controversial and the estimated glomerular filtration rate will not improve with the use of low dose dopamine infusion and they don't have an apparent renal protective effect. The ROSE AHF trial which is the renal optimization strategies evaluation in acute heart failure show that low dose dopamine was no better than a placebo when added to the standard cure. So what are the main indications for the use of dopamine? Because dopamine causes increase in heart rate and has an intense proarrhythmic potential, it has become mainly a second line therapy for the treatment of cardiogenic shock and the patients with heart failure. It is mainly used in patients with cardiogenic shock, which has low cardiac output and which also have bradycardia. But it can be used in patients with symptomatic bradycardia who are unresponsive to atropine and pacing and also in patients in whom sympathetic nervous system is very less like the patients with spinal shock or neurogenic shock. The next agent is dobutamine. Dobutamine is a synthetic catecholamine. It has a direct beta-1 agonist action but a limited beta-2 action. The ratio of beta-1 to beta-2 action is 3 is to 1. So because of beta-1 agonist action, it will result in an inotropic effect and because of the beta-2 organism, it will lead to vasodilatation. So it's an inodilator. It is available in a 5 ml ampule with a concentration of 50 mg per ml. So since it will result in the activation of beta 1 receptor, there will be increase in the heart rate, there will be increase in the contractility of the heart and overall there is an increase in the cardiac output. But it has a beta 2 agonism, so there will be a decrease of systemic vascular resistance and peripheral vascular resistance. The dosage of the dobutamine is 2 to 20 mics per kg per minute. But remember that in doses above 10 mics per kg per minute, there is no added benefit seen and the patients on chronic dobutamine therapy also show tachyphylaxis. So if there is a need of using higher doses of dobutamine, it is necessary to add another vasopressor or an inotropic agent in the patient. Now the indications for the dobutamine is that, that it has become the first line therapy in the low cardiac output states like cardiogenic shock, decompensated heart failure and sepsis induced myopathy. It is because it's an inodilator. So it will result in increased inotropy and chronotropicity along with vasodilation. It, the other most important feature or indication of dobutamine will be cardiac stress testing. But the important thing to be you noted about dobutamine is that if you are using dobutamine in a patient with cardiogenic shock, then the patient need not be hypotensive or the systolic blood pressure should not be below 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Else, the use of dobutamine will cause further hypotension. Also, it should not be used in patients with fixed output conditions like patients with HOCM or aortic stenosis. Here also, it can cause precipitous hypertension. So these are the differences between dopamine and dobutamine. So basically dopamine is a natural catecholamine and dopamine is a synthetic catecholamine. It acts on adrenergic and dopaminergic receptors and it is purely adrenergic. And indication wise, as you can see that dobutamine cannot be used in patients with shock 
which means that they should not have hypotension. But it has definitely become the first line of therapy in patients with cardiac failure and ischemic left ventricular failure. Coming on to norepinephrine or noradrenaline. It is an endogenous neurotransmitter which is present in the postganglionic sympathetic nerve endings. It mainly acts on the alpha 1 and the alpha 2 receptors and also on the beta. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, beta 1 receptors, but uh, it has a limited beta 2 receptors. It has a short half life of around 2.5 minutes. So, continuous infusion is preferred and it is used in the dosage of 0.01 to 0.3 mics per kg per minute or 2 to 16 mics per minute. It is available in a strength of 4 mg per 2 ml as noradrenaline by tartrate of which noradrenaline is only 2 mg. So what does noradrenaline do? It will mainly result in increased contractility and increased cardiac output along with increased systemic and peripheral vascular resistance. This is mainly because of the alpha effect and this is contractility will be increased because of the beta 1 effect. But note that because of increase in the BP, there is a reflex decrease in the heart rate. So the heart rate change is always variable with noradrenaline and there is not so much of tachycardia. Because of this reason that the use of noradrenaline is not associated with tachycardia, it has become the first line of treatment in any vasoplegic, septic or distributive shock. It is also used in patients with cardiogenic shock where dobutamine cannot be used alone like cardiogenic shock with hypertension. So there either noradrenaline is used alone or in conjunction with dobutamine. Then epinephrine or adrenaline. It is an endogenous catecholamine which is produced in adrenal medulla. It has a strong beta 1 action, a moderate alpha 1 and alpha 2 action with beta 2 weak action. So it's basically a chronotropic, inotropic and a vasopressor agent. It is available in the strength of 1 is to 1000 which is 1 milligram per ml. It is a 1 ml ampule and has a strength of 1 milligram of adrenaline by tartarate. So the dose of the nor uh, of the epinephrine will be 10 to 30 nanograms per kg per minute when it will mainly act on the beta receptors and it is considered to be the low dose of adrenaline on moderate doses of 30 to 150 nanograms per kg per minute it will act on predominantly beta receptors and mildly on the alpha receptors but on higher doses of more than 150 nanograms per kg per minute the alpha action will predominate the dosage is 0.01 to 0.4 mics per kg per minute or 2 to 10 mics per minute. If used as a bolus, it can be used in the dose of 2 to 16 mics IV. It could be used for treatment of shock or hypertension. If used for cardiac arrest, it has to be given as 1 milligram bolus every 3 to 5 minutes. If used for anaphylaxis or bronchospasm, it can be used in a dose of 10 to 10 mics per kg intramuscularly or subcutaneous up to a maximum dose of 400 micrograms. Now the indications for adrenaline is it is the first line of therapy for cardiac arrest due to acestole or ventricular fibrillation. Also it is the first line of therapy for anaphylaxis and this is mainly because of the beta 2 agonism which will help in the treatment of laryngeal edema. The other indications include treatment of bronchospasm, low output after cardiopulmonary bypass, treatment of hypertension with spinal or epidural if you need to prolong the action of local anesthetic and as an add-on agent in septic shock when addition of noradrenaline is not sufficient in the treatment. Now, these are the differences between adrenaline and noradrenaline. It is secreted in the adrenal medulla and forms the majority of uh, the hormone and uh, noradrenaline forms a 20% of the secretion. It acts both on alpha and beta receptors whereas the noradrenaline has predominantly an alpha action. 
coming out to isoproterenol or also known as isoprenaline. It is a synthetic catecholamine. It is also known as a chemical pacemaker because it has a purely beta agonist action, both beta 1 and beta 2 with no alpha action. Now, it is available in the packaging of 2 mg per ml ampule and the dose includes 20 to 500 nanograms per kg per minute or 0.01 to 0.1 micrograms per kg per minute. Now the main functions of the isoproterenol is to increase the heart rate and contractility which will result in increased cardiac output. But note that it since it has a beta 2 agonism action also, the systemic and the peripheral vascular resistance will be decreased. So the main indications for isoproterenol are very specific because beta agonist action can result in tachycardia and arrhythmias. So the main indication is as a bridging therapy to pacing. It can also be used as a temporary therapy in AV block and when there is a beta blocker overdose. Phenylephrine. It's a potent non-catecholamine. So as isoproterenol is a specific beta agonist, Phenylephrine is a specific alpha adrenergic agonist and it will result in vasoconstriction in the arterioles. It is available as phenylephrine hydrochloride in a packaging insert of 10 mg per ml. The polars can be given in a dose of 1 to 10 mics per kg IV every 10 to 15 minutes and for infusion you can use a dose of 0.5 to 10 mics per kg per minute. The indications are mainly to treat hypotension. So it can be used in fixed art cardiac output states like aortic stenosis and HOCM with hypotension where you actually don't need tachycardia. It is also the first line of drug for treating post spinal hypotension in parturian patients. Also to treat the cyanotic spells in patients with tetralogy of phallum. Ephedrine. Ephedrine has got direct and indirect acting adrenergic agonist actions. Direct, it acts on alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. And indirect, it acts on the norepinephrine release from the neurons. It is available as ephedrine sulfate in a concentration of 50 mg per ml. The dosage can be in 5 to 10 mg IV polars. The use was to in the post spinal hypotension, but now phenylephrine has become the first choice. It is not used nowadays for treating hypotension in parturian patients because of the more chances of fetal acidosis seen with ephedrine. Coming on to phosphodiesterase inhibitors, so milrinone is a classical example and it will result in the inhibition of phosphodiesterase enzyme 3 inhibition. So this will result in increased cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP increases in the myocardium and it will result in positive inotropy, chronotropy, dromotropy and automaticity. Also, in the vascular smooth muscle, it will result in vasodilatation, leucotropy. So, because of combined these two effects, it's an inodilator. So, the best effects of phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors will be with the addition of noradrenaline. So, it will result in increased cardiac output and contractility of the heart along with decrease in systemic and vascular peripheral resistance. So, it, the loading dose of milrinone is 50 mics per kg over 10 minutes, followed by an infusion of 0.3 to 0.75 mics per kg per minute. Remember that it has a long half-life of 2 to 4 hours and the dose has to be adjusted as per the creatinine clearance. It is available in a concentration of 1 mg per ml as milrinone lactate injection. The indications are basically low cardiac output syndrome with increased left ventricular and diastolic pressure and also a decompensated heart failure and refractory shock patients. Vasopressin. Vasopressin is an endogenous agent which is stored in posterior pituitary. It is also known as antidiuretic hormone and it is secreted in response to plasma osmolality, hypotension, hypoxia and pain. 
the mechanism of action is by acting on the v1 receptors which will result in the vascular smooth muscle vasoconstriction and by acting on the v2 receptors which are present in the renal collecting duct which will result in water reabsorption it can be used in bolus dose of 40 units iv or if used as an infusion it is used in a common fixed dose of 0 0.04 units per minute <laughs> The indications for vasopressin, they are the second line to not adrenaline in vasodilatory shock. Uh, also, the level of evidence is very weak for the use of vasopressin in cardiac arrest and ventral ventricular fibrillation. Vasopressin is available as vasopressin injection in a concentration of 20 units per ml. Levosimindan, it is basically a calcium sensitizer that increases the affinity of troponin C for calcium. It also acts by opening of ATP dependent potassium channels. It's an inodilator. First of all, it is not very freely available and also there are no added benefits of its use of over and above the other agents. So it is not of much clinical significance. So this is a comparative of various vasotropes and inotropes which we have learned so far. So as you can see that we have to know the various receptors on which these drugs act to know what kind of an effect they will show. Like dobutamine will have a predominantly beta action. Milrinone will act on cyclic AMP in increased, it will result in increased cyclic AMP by the inhibition of phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors. Isoprotonol has predominantly a beta action. Vasopressin will act on V1 and V2 receptors. Phenylephrine will act on only alpha receptors. Norepinephrine has a predominantly alpha effect, whereas epinephrine has a predominantly beta effect. Dopamine will act on as well as adrenergic receptors, and dobutamine has both alpha and beta effects. So, what are the key learnings after reading the individual agents? So, dobutamine is the first line agent for cardiogenic shock. Specifically, if the systolic blood pressure is between 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury and in the absence of the signs of the shock. But when a patient is not responding to dobutamine, then either noradrenaline should be used either alone or in combination with dobutamine. Specifically, if there are symptoms of shock and also if the systolic blood pressure is less than 70. In emergency revascularization of acute myocardial infarction, dobutamine and phosphodiesterase inhibitors are beneficial. Dobutamine, dopamine and milrinone either alone or in combination therapy are useful drugs for refractory heart failure. In marked ventricular hypertrophies like severe aortic stenosis and HOCM, beta adrenergic agents should be used with caution because these can result in severe hypotension. Shock with low cardiac output in Brady will result in the use of dopamine because there tachycardia is not a problem. Septic shock with high cardiac output nor adrenaline is the first choice of drug. Maternal hypotension with spinal anesthesia, death spells and TOF and hypotension in severe MS and AS are all treated by phenylephrine as a first line agent. So, a word about inotropes used in ICU. So, when do we use vasopressors in ICU? When we have to maintain a map of more than 65 millimeters of mercury. And here, noradrenaline is the first choice vasopressor which has a level evidence of 1B. <coughs> Vasopressin is added only when there is no response to norepinephrine. So after learning about all these drugs, we come to the individual case scenarios. So a 56 year old female presents with community acquired right upper lobe pneumonia. She has a heart rate of 140 beats per minute, a BP of 75 by 30 millimeters of mercury. She is oliguric and has a temperature of 38.7. She feels warm to touch with a bounding pulse. So clearly this is a case of septic shock and the treatment of choice will be noradrenaline and if the patient is not responding to noradrenaline then vasopressin. 
Second case scenario is that a 25 year old male patient which is admitted to the surgical ICU with blunt injury abdomen and multiple rib fracture along with right femur fracture with a heart rate of 140 beats per minute and a BP of 100 by 75 with cold peripheries. So this is a case of hypovolemic shock and should be treated with bony injury stabilization fluids and if the BP is not picking up with fluids then you have to add noradrenaline. Then the third case scenario, a 70 year old man presents with an acute myocardial infarction. He has received immediate conservative treatment for his medical team, but has become tachycardic, hypotensive, peripherally cold due to vasoconstriction and is oleguric. So this is a case of cardiogenic shock and the treatment of the choice will be dobutamine and milrinone. So these are the future inotropes which can come into a bigger practice in the recent times. The suggested readings for all the postgraduated students is stated underneath. And thank you and best of luck for your exams. Thank you Shipra for nicely covering the topic along with the various receptors, various mechanism of action of the drugs, dosage, side effect, and along with that, the case scenarios. So it's, it was a very nice presentation. And are there any questions, Nitin, in the chat box? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. So thank you so much to all the speakers. Thank you so much, ma'am. <clears throat> thank you, ma'am, for your valuable time. And thanks to all the speakers for such thank a you, presentation. Thank you. So with this, we come towards the end of today's day. Hope you guys had a good time. Before we disperse, just again, I would like to remind two things. The quiz will start. You can see a quiz button on, the, on your screens. So I ask all the delegates to kindly uh, start answering the quiz questions. And the second thing is regarding the feedback. Please do give us your feedback so that we can improve. Okay. Thank you so much. See you guys tomorrow sharp at 8 a.m. Thank you so much.